Hey everyone, and oh my goodness, today is a huge, huge, huge day. Since the beginning of my channel, one project has been talked about more than anything else. Go Regional Express Rail, later known as Go Expansion. Bad name, and still known as that. A flashier name would honestly be really great. This project will mean modern, zero emissions electric train, which should holistically be the best regional rail system in North America, bar none. And now we can finally say the contracts have been signed, it's happening. And we've also learned a lot more about what it will look like. Let's talk about that. For coverage of all of the crazy stuff going on in Toronto Transit for the next couple years to the next decade, from massive subway extensions to North America's most modern metro line to new tram lines, new streetcar expansions, GO Regional Express Rail, as well as new intercity trains and coverage around the world, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon. And if you want to help me produce more and higher quality content, consider supporting on Patreon or by hitting the join button for YouTube memberships. We learned a lot today about GO Expansion and its current state and what's going to happen, so let's dive right in. From what we've heard, GO RER is alive and well. The promise of 15 minute bi-directional service on most lines is going to be met, and frankly, it's going to be far exceeded. Now we already knew that it would be exceeded with the reference concept design presented in the Go RER business case a few years ago, but it sounds like we're probably even going to get more than that, which is awesome, because that plan had us getting 15 minute service at a minimum and seven and a half minute service in some places. There's actually a mention of six to 15 minute headways, which is an improvement over the previous peak service levels. And it sounds like much more of the system will be getting those peak six minute headways. Now what seems likely to have happened here is that while previous plans called for operating a lot of 15 minute service on a lot of sections of track that were already double track and electrified, it seems like the actual plans that are going to be developed are much more aggressive, running each double track electrified rail corridor at sub 10 minute headways at peak periods, which would mean having trains coming to the three quad track regional rail subway interchanges we have in the city, or will have, hopefully, in the future, Exhibition, East Harbor, and Floor Dundas West every few minutes during peak periods when you consider the combined frequencies of the local and express services. Of course, there's also the Berry Line to the west traveling north of Toronto, which could combine with the Lakeshore and Kitchener corridors to provide service every minute or so into Union Station. But of course, we're not building a Spadina station for that. <sighs> Some things will never change. Instead, it seems the shoulders we'll be getting are going to be those regional rail subway interchanges, which isn't the end of the world, I guess, but does miss out on the opportunity to serve more of the downtown core and limits our shoulder stations to four platform tracks with at most two or three services. At the same time, there's a lot of mention of faster services, which makes a lot of sense for a number of reasons. We've talked historically a lot in Toronto about the benefits of faster accelerating electric trains, but truth be told, top speeds probably should also increase on the GO network, especially since so much of it is tangent or dead straight. Seriously, if you look at, for example, the Georgetown South Corridor, it's like a bunch of straight lines connected with a few minor curves. At the same time, the stop spacings on go for better or for worse are really long. And so getting to higher top speeds or at least hitting higher top average speeds is totally feasible. All of these speed ups are something we've heard a lot about, but the impact is honestly incredibly huge. Now, specific mention is made of the travel time between some key stations and the reduction in travel time is mind boggling. A trip to Bramley, for example, right now takes the better part of 40 minutes, but when electrification and other improvements are made, that trip time will be cut almost in half to around 20 minutes. At the same time, longer distance services to places like Barrie and Hamilton will be faster than typical driving conditions. There are also really smart comparisons made between trips on the GO network and trips on the subway network to give you a sense of how far you can go on the subway network in a given period of time and how far you can go on the GO network once it's been upgraded. For example, on the new enhanced GO network, getting to Bloor Dundas West or Mimico should take the same amount of time as going from Union to Bloor Young on the subway. Getting to Bramley or Port Credit should take about the same amount of time as going to Union to Broadview on the subway. And going to Oakville or Pickering should be about the same amount of time as going from Union to High Park. These travel times are incredibly impressive and mean that not only will Go be really attractive because it will be super frequent, but it will be so much faster than it is today, which means that not only will it be convenient, but it will be faster than driving in a lot of cases, as proper rapid transit should be. 
Now you're probably wondering how this is possible. We can make some educated guesses. As I've mentioned before, a lot of the track on the GO network is tangent, and a lot of the corridors are totally capable of much higher speeds. At the same time, there's obviously massive amounts of room to hit higher top speeds directly after leaving a station with electric trains, as well as not having random slowdowns and pauses because of signaling issues, which is something I'll probably have to dedicate a whole other video to signaling on the GO network what it was, what it will be. At the same time, we'll probably also see things like quality improvements to the actual alignment and design and construction of tracks, as well as these switches and other components of the railway, which along with signaling feel like the type of optimizations we were going for by having some European railway planners help design this system. Suffice to say, existing GO operations, signaling, and infrastructure isn't really a super tight ship and there's a lot of room for improvement. And it seems like through these plans, a lot of that latent capacity to go faster and more frequently will be unlocked. A slightly less exciting detail that we have kind of been expecting is that no mention of electrical multiple unit trains is made. This means that the system will likely remain a locomotive hauled affair for the foreseeable future, which is sad, but also potentially encouraging. On one hand, as I've mentioned before, it's sad because there's a lot to be gained by using electrical multiple units. At the same time though, we haven't designed our network in a way that would really take advantage of them. And with the current stop spacings, even with some additional stations that we're planning, there's still gonna be wide two, three kilometer gaps, even in most of the tight areas. And what that means is that electrical multiple units probably just wouldn't have provided that much of a benefit over electric locomotives with short trains. At the same time, one of the biggest logistical challenges I was always curious about with Go expansion, Go RER, whatever we're calling it today, is how introduction of electrical multiple units would work. So you would have had to build a brand new facility, it would have had to be new run of the lines, everything would have been fairly complicated too, because to get the trains from that location to in service on other lines could have been complicated. Overall, it seems like logistically using electrical locomotives probably is a lot easier than going to multiple units, at least for today. Basically, electrifying the network's already a big project, adding multiple units on top of that would have pushed it over the edge. At the same time, obviously using electric locomotives allows us to reuse the existing bi-level fleet, and I imagine doing maintenance on electric locomotives versus regular diesel locomotives, which we have the capability to do at the Whitby Maintenance Center, is probably totally feasible with existing infrastructure, while again, multiple units probably isn't. Now all of this we've been kind of quietly suspecting for a while because Go has been running shorter consists during the pandemic, for example, and there's even been mention of like, we're not going back to longer trains, which they may, but probably not for a lot of services. There's also the fact that Go and Metrolinx have been rehabilitating old cab cars that I believe previously were just being used as standard cars, probably so that they can put them at the front of more separate shorter trains so they can operate more frequency. The only thing I will say about electric locomotives is I really do hope we get something really high performance with a good sprinting ability so it can really rapidly pull trains out of a station before hitting a high speed. At the same time, I really hope Alstom, if Alstom is who is going to make these locomotives, it's not totally clear to me, creates a design that kind of incorporates some of those bi-level elements, since it would be weird to have this totally distinct locomotive that looks nothing like something that fits with the existing Go theme. At the end of the day too, as much as I like multiple units, they can always still happen. No one is building a regional rail network like this with hydrogen or battery trains, despite what some suggest, and so that makes sense. Though I will say that the mention of service to Hamilton in the same breath as mentioned to service to Barrie suggests that maybe negotiations with freight railways will allow for electrification of that route, which would be super cool, and would also be really promising for electric service to Kitchener in the future, which I think went unmentioned. Remind you, the team is Deutsche Bahn, FCC, a Spanish railway construction firm that sounds quite experienced, Acon, a Canadian construction firm for infrastructure and stuff, as well as Alstom, who will seemingly be doing operations and maybe rolling the stock, as well as quite likely signaling. And given the promising service levels, it sounds like we're probably gonna get something like ETCS, which is super, super, super exciting. Again, future video on that. Now I do have to say these wildly improved service levels and higher speeds are probably thanks to Deutsche Bahn in no small part, though Metrolinx deserves credit for formulating this whole contract slash bidding process to encourage higher speeds and higher frequencies, which are obviously good for attracting more people to transit. Now I'm not gonna go into great detail about the proposed services because there isn't a ton of discussion of them, but we kind of have a sense of what things probably will look like from previous discussions and the like. We'll probably have through running on the Lakeshore Line, 
through running on the kitchener stovall line and Berry line trains which are at the north of the rail corridor turning around at the new don valley turn back facility though i think it would be much more natural to maybe add some additional platforms at east harbor and turn them there because east harbor is set to be a pretty big hub though again the nice thing about above ground regional rail is we can make changes like that in the future if we so desire now, an interesting tidbit is that service to the airport is integrated, which might sound odd, but honestly doesn't surprise me a ton. I was kind of curious in the past whether GO trains could operate on the Up Express Viaduct, and while I'm not sure it can currently handle their weight, the actual dimensions of the cars seem like they would fit. And the Up Express trains are apparently fairly unreliable and unpopular, and the manufacturer has left North America, so getting rid of those seems like an attractive option, especially if it means getting rid of the specialized infrastructure like the high platforms required to operate them. What that would likely mean though is some modifications to the up specific infrastructure, mostly at Pearson where there are high platforms to make that compatible with go by levels, which I don't think would be modified with high level doors or anything. I think the tracks would just be raised because adding high level doors creates this separate sub fleet of go, which wouldn't make a ton of sense. Nonetheless, using a single common fleet means you could have services direct from the Stova line and potentially the Lakeshore line to the airport, which would be super awesome. Now, there was also some mention of timelines, and what we know is the next two years will be more negotiations and very detailed planning. But some early construction of the well-accepted stuff we're going to need, likely electrification, substations, things like that, should start next year, with a more substantial service ramp up happening around the middle of the decade, 2025 or so. That sounds like it will coincide with the completion of things like the Davenport Diamond, the Scarborough Junction grade separation, and other key projects like those. By the time those projects are done, even if you don't have enhanced signaling fully done or even electrification, there's no reason you couldn't run a 15-minute interlined Kitchener-Stouffville service and a 15-minute interlined Lakeshore West-Lakeshore East service, which would be awesome. The Barry Line might be a little slower, but it could probably get up to a 30-minute headway sometime in the next couple of years once the Davenport Diamond grade separation is done, but a lot less of it is double-tracked, so it's probably a bit of a laggard. Now all of this combined means there will be nearly three times as many trains going into Union Station every single morning. And so it's mentioned that a massive redesign of the station, which has been under construction for 10 years, it's really should have all been combined into one big operation will happen to optimize the platforms, which will likely be combined into wider platforms, as well as redesigning and optimizing the throats of the stations as I talked about doing in a previous video, which is probably frankly half the time savings because of how slow it is right now, as well as simplifying operations. Now, the natural question looking at all of this is, are we just building New Jersey Transit in Toronto? And the answer is, Sort of, but not really. The most obvious one is that since this is a regionally integrated system, there will be through running, which will allow better operations and higher frequency, as well as more consistent frequencies. The network structure is also just really nice with two through running lines and direct service to the airport, no cruddy monorail that drops you off at a station that doesn't have super consistently frequent service. At the same time though, there should be more consistent high speeds and high frequencies, thanks to better station infrastructure, but better service and operations as well, most likely thanks to Deutsche Bahn. But probably most importantly, there should be better service levels and integration with rapid transit, notably at places like Bloor Dundas West, East Harbor, and Exhibition. Honestly, I've waited for this day for over 10 years. And hearing that this project is actually going to happen has already made the year for me. It's incredibly exciting to be in Toronto during one of the biggest transit expansions that's happened in the English speaking world in a long time, honestly, if not ever, as well as being able to share all of it with all of you. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.